Hello. Hi, Hello. everybody. Um, so we're going to start our next session in the SDG Media Zone. It's my pleasure to introduce our UN Under Secretary General for Global Communications, Melissa Fleming, who is going to carry the next session with our very special guest. Thank you. We do have a special guest, and I'd just like to say we're live today from the SDG Media Zone. And this is at the start, or it already started a couple of hours ago, a really important summit on accelerating the SDGs at the halftime moment. Uh, we are very hopeful that this occasion will bring the really needed finance that's, that uh, particularly developing countries uh, require to jumpstart and get back on track to ensure that we end poverty, that we ensure healthy lives, promote gender equality, which is what we're going to be talking about, but also really to tackle climate change. So I have a very special guest today, Natalie Portman, who is the, an Academy Award-winning actress. You all know that. But she's also a director. She's also an author. And she's an activist. Uh, welcome to the UN, Natalie. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. So we have uh, followed two long-standing commitments that you have, one to the environment, and I believe from what I was reading, that began as a really little girl, um, but also to women's issues and your strong advocacy for female em empowerment and gender parity in the workplace. So this month, the United Nations released the Gender Snapshot Report. It painted a worrisome picture um, on how far away we are from re reaching gender equality by 20. 30. So in your view, what can we do to shift these worrying trends? Well, I think investing in girls, in girls' education, in girls' and women's safety, um, in girls' and women's economic and social uh, empowerment, um, I think all of th that focus, um, investing more in it will, will uh, of course, accelerate the, the drive toward parity. I mean, it seems obvious, right? Um, but it really is going to take people waking up to that need. Is there, from what you've seen, and I know you've um, worked for an NGO uh, that is supporting girls, uh, I believe, in Kenya and in other parts of the world, why are you seeing that is there an underinvestment in girls? Well, I think that we have very ingrained bias against women and girls that we really need to combat, and obviously education is a big part of that, and Spotlight Initiative that um, the UN launched in, in 2017 uh, is addressing a lot of that cultural, ingrained cultural um, biases that lead to the, uh, these inequalities and injustices that we see. Yeah, I mean, so it is investing in education really key, oh, investing in education and then educating everyone else so they can overcome biases. But you um, joined the Spotlight Initiative's session here at the UN on ending violence against women and girls yesterday. What did you say to the people there? Well, it really is such um, a, a core part of women's freedom to be free from violence and the threat of violence. And until women can feel, and girls can feel safe, walking down the street, going to school, going to work, um, nothing else can be achieved to the extent that we dream of. Um, so it seems like the, the, the first step is ensuring safety and ensuring freedom of, of movement and freedom of, of living so that women can be, um, free to pursue their, their utmost potential. Yeah, exactly, 50% of the world. And now we have an online environment that has made another space very dangerous, or at least dangerous feeling and threatening feeling for so many girls growing up in the social media age. Is that something that you're concerned about? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the threat and danger that women and girls are subjected to in real life is just as bad, if not worse, online. 
um, and the threats uh, against women who use their voice. I mean, it's all different varieties of trying to silence us. Um, and so I think the more we can support and celebrate women's voices and girls' voices, um, you know, the more we're combating this incredible, um, incredibly, uh, uh, you know, horrible, abusive power. Right. I mean, you were very much behind Time's Up. Um, so what is it, what is, what is so important for Hollywood, uh, women in the industry, why is it so important for you to raise your voices? Because I think it goes beyond demanding that this cannot happen in the film business. It should go well, well beyond that. Well, it was incredible in Time's Up because we gathered with women in other industries as well. We gathered with farm workers and healthcare workers and women in journalism, women in tech, and we were all facing the same sorts of challenges, obviously in different locations or different flavors, but really the same, um, the same threat. And I remember the, the head of the Farm Workers Union, Monica Ramirez, said to me, they tell us to shut up because we're in the shadows and nobody cares about us. And they tell you actresses to shut up because if nobody cares, you're in the light. You're, you know, and she's like, but the, the th common thread is that they're telling all of us to shut up and they're trying to silence all our voices. And I think that was really the power of Tarana Burke's Me Too movement was that it was breaking out of that silence and it was empowering women to make their voices heard and not feel shame around these experiences and recognize that um, these were extreme injustices and that perpetrators needed to be held to account. And many of them have. You think that that has changed things? I think that people are very aware of it now and that there isn't a sense that you can just abuse as you wish without facing any consequences. So, um, and I think that people talk about it a lot more and are a lot more open about it. We still have a far way to go, of course, but I think the Tarana Burks movement really, really cracked open a door that is not going to shut anymore. Yeah, and indeed it was uh, reported all over the world. It wasn't just a, a US thing. I think it provided women with the sense of hope and, and empowerment. But you've uh, been involved also in countries that are less rich and less pri privileged. Are you, I mean, is there, is it different for girls in, in countries that are developing? Yeah, I think unfortunately, women and girls around the world can relate to each other with facing violence and the threat of violence. I think that unfortunately that's, that's present everywhere. But of course there's different um, manifestations of it in different places. Some girls are, you know, threatened with violence for going to school, which of course in the United States we don't, um, we don't experience. But in the United States, the number one cause of death for pregnant women is being murdered by their intimate partner. So there's, you, you see that, that in different places, of course, you know, in Iran, we're seeing women who are being murdered for exposing their hair. So really, the thread is that women and girls are, are being murdered and threatened and, um, you know, uh, abused uh, because of anything. P you know, it almost feels it almost feels arbitrary the the reasons that they choose to commit these acts of violence. Mm. You mentioned you know at the beginning how important investment is, and you know you became involved with this joint United Nations European Union initiative, the Spotlight Initiative. What brought you to this initiative? And is there anything you want to say that inspires you about it? Well, Natalie, uh, another Natalie who uh, works at Spotlight is uh, uh, close to someone I'm I'm friends with, and that's how I got uh, engaged in um, in Spotlight. And their work is has been really extraordinary in reaching many different countries to change laws, to implement educational tools, to change culture so that you know masculinity is reframed as 
one of empathy rather than one of aggression and teaching young people about their, their rights and also supporting um, civil society organizations on the ground, a lot of feminist movements um, in countries so that the people who are doing the work on the ground who know the country are leading the, the, the work and also of course providing su survivor support systems um, because unfortunately the, the violence is so widespread and so varied. There's a, an enormous number of inputs that need to be, um, need to be created to, to both prevent the violence and then also deal with the consequences of the violence to help survivors emotionally, psychologically, physically, and also to hold the perpetrators to account. I mean, you mentioned the masculinity issue um, and educating men that masculinity is actually empathy. How, how does one do that? Well, I think that culture can play a big role in shaping that. I think when we see different models of masculinity on screen or in literature or in popular culture, then we can, um, we have more possibilities. We open up more possibilities for men. And then of course, education um, of, as well, you know, showing the effects of, of toxic masculinity and reframing and just widening the options, I think. It, it opens up boys and men's worlds too to have more options of how you can be and not this very narrow, um, prescriptive definition of masculinity. Can the film industry help with that and how you know narratives are created, how how figures and superheroes are depicted? Absolutely, I think that um, film and television can absolutely help shape new forms of masculinity that are much more um, much more reflective of what we know to be the human soul that is allowed to have many different colors and not just this very narrow kind of like aggressive macho type that we we have so so deeply ingrained in our culture indeed men need young men need those kinds of role models so finally um i was excited to hear that you are part owner of the angel city football club or here you would is it called football or soccer club Football club, yeah. Football club, and they made their debut at the Women's Soccer League last year. Can you tell us a bit more about why you got involved? I mean, this sounds like a real empowering women uh, investment on your part. Absolutely. Well, it was, it was very much out of this um, idea that I've been talking to you about, about seeing both women and men in different ways than we traditionally have seen them. And when I saw my son watching the Women's World Cup four years ago, I realized that he looked to the women athletes the same way he looked to the male athletes. And I realized, why don't we have this on a regular basis at home? And what a different world it would be if our boys and girls and all kids growing up could see women athletes given the value that they deserve like the men are. And so we've, we started this women's football team in Los Angeles. Um, uh, two, it's, we, we started playing two years ago and it's just been an incredible um, thing to be part of to see these virtuosic athletes celebrated the way they deserve um, you know, on, a, on a big stage. Why are they called Angel City? Because Los Angeles oh. is the city of angels. <laughs> yeah. The city of angels. Really exciting. Natalie, I want to thank you today for taking the time to sit thank down with so us. Thank you so much for having me. In the SDG Media Zone. Gender equality, cross cuts, so many other critical issues such as access to health care, to education, discrimination, poverty, and more. And all of us here can play our part um, to empowering women, to investing in women and girls and to stopping the scourge of violence against females. Thank you so much, Natalie, for Thank joining you so us. Much. Thank you. Thanks.